All right, Movember, day nine, mustache. I have not been growing one because I just couldn't get rid of this one. It's called The Ridiculous. And uh, today I want to present uh, something out of uh, Facing Addiction and Facing the Shadow by Patrick Carnes. This book's also uh, collaborated with uh, Stephanie Carnes and John Bailey. And it's The Addictive System. So I just want to run through what I would run through with a person that has come in for treatment and they're asking about addiction and how it works. Uh, generally, their first questions are, look, is this just a use issue? Is it an abuse issue or is it an addiction issue? So those three things I think are interesting because that's what people are looking at. So they wonder that when I'm using it, is it, it you know, down here, is it just, is it just about use? Um, and I'm just having a bit of trouble. Am I, have I moved to that area where I'm abusing it or has it got to a point where I'm an addict? Now, usually the people that see me are from the abuse area up and uh, either way, generally you need some harm intervention at a minimum, but, but to answer that question of am I an addict, we run through the criteria of addiction. Is it compulsive use? Is there impaired control? Is there continued use in spite of consequence? Are you experiencing the phenomenon of craving, which usually embodies uh, withdrawal and um, tolerance issues? And is there evidence of denial that you're able to minimize use and consequence? And generally, um, if someone's in a pre-contemplative, contemplative stage of change, then the evidence of denial is there's baffled people around them at the very least. People that are coming to them saying, I love you and I'm confused, what the hell's going on? So if, if that's the case, we, we look for um, not just identifying what is uh, happening here in the acting out and whether to stop or harm minimize let's just say we're dealing with an addict so this is the addictive system so people come in and they say look i want to stop but i'm having trouble stopping they they you know it's it's not that hard to stop it's the staying stop that's hard so so let's go through why is this the case what what happens when addiction is a system in your life that embodies this cycle that if you're unaware of it just continues to regenerate itself so Patrick Kahn's uh, put this system together um, in Facing the Shadow, and he says that the addictive system runs um, at its heart is core beliefs. Things about ourselves that we either have identified now as a result of this system in action, or they've come from earlier life. And generally, you would see that they involve some sort of I am statement. I am dumb. I am worthless. I am unlovable. I am a pervert. I am hopeless. And so these can be largely unconscious. Carl Jung had that saying, if you don't make the unconscious conscious, it'll direct your life and you'll call it fate. And so this, these, these beliefs for a lot of us can be really buried. For some of us, we lead with our chin. They're right at the front, but we don't know what to do with them. But this discomfort, this core discomfort, um, leads us on to impaired thinking. Because the, the impaired thinking is not just about what's happening here, which is all cognitive distortions. It, it's about, well, I need some relief, but this stuff I'm doing is not really that good for me. So I've got to come up with impaired thoughts. So in the beginning of the addictive cycle, before a lot of unmanageability is, is created, the impaired thinking might be everyone does it. I've worked with people that say this city I'm in is... Uh, is everybody does it, every married man does this, every person bets on the Melbourne Cup. Um, whatever the addiction is, there'll be an impaired thought. As we go on in our addiction, there's more unmanageability, more despair, more acting out, the impaired thinking gets even crazier and largely starts to embody um, sort of, I'm gonna stop, we'll stop on Monday, we'll just drink, not take drugs, we'll just take drugs, not drink, we'll just gamble on lottery tickets on not the horses or just the poker machines, not whatever, fill in the blank. But the impaired thoughts is where eventually when you seek treatment, you see the insanity of repeating the same mistakes and expecting a different result. But the main job of the impaired thought is to just get us into the cycle of addiction. Now, the cycle once we're into it has, has four major components. The first thing is preoccupation. Now, preoccupation has the elements of obsession, so we just go into being obsessed about using, and that obsession has one job, really. It creates euphoric recall. Now, already for Movember, I put together just a little um, excerpt video on what's the definition of addiction, what's the criteria of addiction. So if we go off that definition being that we have a brain disease, 
Now there's my dyslexia. I'm not going to start this video again. Let's just go with, uh, instead of calling the brain Brian, which a lot of dyslexic out, so dyslexics out there do. We've got a brain disorder of reward, memory, and motivation circuitry. So this, this, this brain disorder already gets triggered from the, the, the burst of dopamine, the burst of uh, serotonin. If you've got a lot of impaired thinking and it's crazy and there's a lot of problems as, as a result now of this continued use in spite of consequence, then, then at this point there could be adrenaline and cortisol and the whole limbic system's involved, but we're excited. And if I use a, 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 a way of describing it that a colleague of mine used in the Blue Mountains, Sharon Naylor, she, she would say that addicts get a 20 out of 10 syndrome, that, that this burst of energy really early on for us is really different and separates us from our co cohorts. This is the stuff that Valerie Voon, the professor what, that, that studied sex addiction and other addictions uh, the, the, uh, with a fMRI uh, images, would be able to see this part of the brain active just in the obsession of alone. Now what the obsession does in this euphoric recall and now this real uh, brain uh, uh, sort of reaction is it throws us pretty quickly into rituals. Now, if you go to 12 step fellowships, they talk about being powerless over people, places and things. And what can happen for the brain is that we will we will get triggered and get more of these uh, brain chemicals happening as a result of this sort of hunt mode. We go from obsession into ritual and, and we will be, before we even act out, before we even take a drink or a drug, if that's the poison of choice, that our brain disorder of, of reward, memory and motivation is now fully active. We're on fire. If you see an addict thinking of using at this point, their whole face usually can't sort of hide it. Now, if, if you're just in active addiction, what that does is it sets up acting out. We go down and we act out and, and look, acting out, if you're an addict with this 20 out of 10 syndrome, you now add the chemical or add the behavior, we're in heaven. This is why we do it. We're not stupid people. We act out and it feels good. Now, early on, we're, if we're just in use, this is fabulous. We have the next day off. We've, you know, we, we go back to work. We're doing fine. If you're in abuse, then, then, then you might start to feel a bit sort of shady over here and you're going to get some issues that start letting you know this is probably not good. If you're in addiction, then once the acting out wears off, we go into a shame, despair, abandonment um, and sort of guilt cycle. The more this addiction has taken place, the more consequences that are, that are, that are um, gathering, the bigger this shame pit will be. So we act out with preoccupation, we get obsessed, we go into euphoric recall, we start off with the rituals that lead to the, um, the drugs, the dealer, the tab, the, the bong, the iPhone, the computer if it's sex addiction, the poker machine, we act out, we go into the shame spiral. And the other part of this phenomenon is, is once the brain goes into distress and stress, we have in, in our motivation circuitry a, a, a whole part of the brain that motivates us to f towards feeling better. And so guess what? For addicts, we just go, well, I got a good idea how to get rid of this stress. We get back into obsession and around and around and around we go until we have to stop. Then the problems of unmanageability acquire and, and it might be financial problems, it might be legal problems, it might be health problems. And uh, you know it might be relationship problems, but what happens is there will be problems if you're an addict because we have continued use in spite of consequence, and so they generally confirm the core beliefs that I am worthless, unlovable, not good enough, and our head says, well, we deserve you know to 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 act out again, or we can't help but act out again. We're an addict, we can't help it. They misuse the concept of powerlessness, and around and around we go. If you're trying to dismantle this, uh, then, then there's uh, a couple of things that I think are really important. Most people just try and stop here or they just try and stop here. They say, look, I can't help uh, being a sex addict. I objectify women. They're everywhere. I go to the beach. That's what I do. And, and, and I just won't act out when I get home on porn. I just won't uh, act out in fill in the blank. 
And so they try and stop it. They don't change their, their impaired thinking. They don't dismantle this cycle. They don't, as Patrick Kahn say, have a paradigm shift into second order change. They just say, I'm going to stop this. I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing these other behaviors because they're not that bad. People that do that generally continue to relapse. And eventually they uh, identify that that is part of their impaired thinking. But a couple of uh, tricks with this, if you relate to this, be careful of these things. A lot of folks will come uh, into recovery and they will ask for help over here. It's where we usually reach out. We can't stop, please help me. I've got a lot of problems. My partner's discovered what's going on. I really need support. I'm in an existential funk and shame bind a spiritual breakdown please help me so they ask for help on this side and and you can get good help there you can come to a therapist you can do, do, uh, sort of unload all your stuff go to a 12-step meeting unload all your stuff come back next week they clap and say thanks very much and and even when you get into recovery you can keep acting out you don't stop and dismantle this side of it keep acting out feel bad uh, get problems go to a meeting ask for help gets better but they don't get well but you find a community to look after you. If you want to get better, we have to learn to ask for help over here. And I will say this, most people put their bottom lines at, at, at acting out because the acting out behavior is their bottom lines for their 12 step work. And this is informative and it lets you know if you're in Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous or Sex Addicts Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, can't drink, can't do porn, can't gamble, they work out, well, that's my bottom lines, I just won't do that. People that get well put their bottom lines up here. And they go, I can't do any of the above. I can't afford to go into the insanity of impaired thinking. I cannot afford any secrets up here. I need to let the people that know and love me and can help me into this area, what I call a Bermuda Triangle. Because this is where addicts keep their secrets. They don't talk about their impaired thinking, they don't talk about the stuff that causes obsession and euphoric recall, and they don't tell people when they get into their rituals. They try, they maybe shout out down here saying, oh, I'm having a bad day, I need help. But by then there's usually too much momentum and they say the famous words of addiction, effort, and off they go in. So, please, if you're listening to this and you're harboring secrets and you're keeping hold of stuff in impaired thinking, preoccupation and rituals, let somebody know. Start talking to your therapist, a, a close friend, a partner, reach out to an addiction professional that can help you with this. And eventually, once we dismantle this, we will have to get back to and address those core beliefs because none of us deserve to live with that sort of inner critic beating the hell out of us. Now, this is just the addictive system and having knowledge of it and dismantling it and moving those bottom lines will get you well, but it won't create recovery. And recovery is the next cycle I'm going to do, and I'll do that this afternoon. So remember, it's Movember. If you like this video, subscribe. Press that little bell thing. I'm new to this YouTube thing. I love YouTube, but I want to make my own channel. So this is for Movember. Please donate. Send it on to any other man or woman that thinks you, that suffers from addiction. And uh, remember to be gentle with your heart. Bye-bye.